I started off as a child, <laughs> and uh, my first memories are from the Isle of Bute. I wasn't born there, I was born in Perth, in Scotland, but we moved to Rothsey in the Isle of Bute while I was only an infant. And I spent my school years there till I was 15 and joined the Navy as soon as I got a chance with it. When the war broke out, every boy my age was dashing to join the Army or the Air Force. But my mother, uh, she, she had lost brothers in the First World War and didn't want me to join the Army under any circumstances. So I took advantage of that and joined the Navy. They sent me to the Isle of Man to get trained. But before then, they were sending boys to uh, training schools in Edinburgh or to uh, HMS Ganges down in Suffolk. But trained the boys until they were good enough to go to sea. But when the war broke out, they had to send them to some safe place. And earlier on in the war, there were boys who were being trained on board a battleship in the Scapa Flow, in the safe anchorage in Scapa Flow. And there were 200 boys on the Royal Oak being trained when a German submarine crept into the Scapa Flow, defeated the ship and sank it, and the 200 boys had been told to stand where you are, don't move, you know, and they, they drowned. And because of that, there's a female prime, a member of parliament questioned the fact that boys were being sent to sea. And she brought in the ruling that no boy under 18 was to be allowed to go to sea, which is fair enough. Except when we were in training, we were trained to a certain standard, which was good enough to, to, to call us no longer boy seamen, but able seamen. And you could go to sea, in my case, as a telegraphist, ordinary telegraphist, not a boy telegraphist. I was just coming up to 18, so it didn't matter so much. But that was how she, they got over it, these boys of 17 and a half were promoted to ordinary seamen and off they went. And no doubt some of them were ended their life before their 18th birthday. This is a matter of chance, of course. How did you get from Scotland down to the, over to the Isle of Man? Well, <laughs> they, I was given a date to report to the re recruiting office in Glasgow beginning of March 1940 and I went up by boat and train to get there and there was 12 other lads there waiting to be transported. They came from Aberdeen, they were fishermen's sons, they knew all about the sea because they'd been to sea with their father fishing. Anyway, they sent us by train to Liverpool uh, under no, under no uh, circumstances were allowed to leave the train. Somebody was put in charge of us. And when we arrived at Liverpool, there's all string of lads coming up from all around England. And we were uh, sent down to a church hall somewhere near the pier. And slept there overnight and then joined the Manx steamer the next morning. And there we were off to sea for the first time in our lives, most of us, until we got to the, into the Irish Sea and it was really, well, it was probably a normal trip for the Mike's boat, but to us it was a terribly stormy day and everybody was sick, except me. I kept a straight face, but I was feeling ill, but I wouldn't be sick. Anyway, that was the introduction to the Royal Navy, straight onto a coach from the, uh, at the pier head, up to Howe Street Camp. And then there we were stuck for six weeks, not allowed to go anywhere or do anything until we had these six weeks in. So, and from there we went to Cunningham Camp, which was HMS St George itself, probably, and we spent a year and three months doing our courses. 
and I went to see it then on August 1941, I was coming up to 18. It must have been quite a culture shock for you, meeting people from all over the country. Oh, absolutely. Well, we didn't understand each other. I mean, the Geordies from Newcastle, they were a different language. And, of course, I was strange to them as they wrote to me. Yeah. And laddies from London couldn't understand them either. But, uh, as you say, it's a different culture, but we certainly learned how to understand when we went aboard the ship because they were just the same. They didn't change the language when they went to sea. Unless we were speaking to the captain and they put a polite accent on. <laughs> of course. So that's an advantage of using Morse, isn't it? It's, it's international. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so what, what are your memories of the house strike camp to start with? You were under canvas, I think, were you? No, but, no. Oh, it, right. it was a, the cabins for three people. There were three beds in each cabin. And... Uh, you didn't choose your uh, your cabin mate. I mean, there was, you were stuck with two fields. You, you, you had no idea who they were. My two were one from London. And I kept with that chap, careful. We got on all right, but that was... To begin with, in, in house streak, we, we learned how to march and shoulder arms and all that sort of stuff. But we didn't do any great uh, training in signals. We were tra- we did a, a school course, had to write essays, essays and they, from that they chose out who was going to go to the higher class mm. and that. And they decided it could be either signalmen or um, wireless operators. But to, when they did eventually let us, or, uh, they let us go on walks into Douglas, but. That was after we we went to coming on camp from House Street. You did six weeks in House Street and a year in Cunningham's camp. But at this particular time, they were bringing boys from all over the place, and Cunningham's camp became too full, and they sent the most recent uh, resident back to House Street. So we spent another. Well, three or four months in her streak in the summer of 1940. And, but they allowed us out there, but no transport. We said, you can go to Douglas, be back by six o'clock. And we had to walk all the way into Douglas and walk all the way back. <laughs> you know, they didn't get, the, they let you out at one o'clock. You've got to be back by six. So we had to walk to Douglas and back and hopefully meet girls or whatever <laughs> in the meantime. Yeah, well, of course, you met a very special girl, didn't you, while you were on the island? Well, yes, later on, the following year, 1940, when we started, and I met my wife in 1941, before I sent off to sea. And, of course, from that visit came a life. Then we were married for 69 years. Yeah. Uh, what, were, were the local people very hospitable and very friendly to the, the young lads in, in the naval uniform? The Manx people were excellent. Oh, yeah. um, the, most lads could tell the tale they'd been invited in for tea. And it wasn't a question in today and not tea again. Come back to, uh, tomorrow or come back the next day. Yeah, oh, that's good. So, uh, we, actually, we got very friendly with them. Mm-hmm. We found this... Not only in the Isle of Man, mind you, we found this later on when we were stationed in America. Because American people also had a British blood in them. And these particular people, these particular people did invite us in. But that's a different story, mm. of course. Mm. What was discipline like at HMS St George? It was very sharp. If you did anything wrong, you got... Uh, clobbered. <laughs> I mean, it, it, there was no really bad convicts or anything amongst the boys. They, they did what they were told. If they didn't do it, they got a cl- cleft across the ear, you know. But if they did anything bad, they could get caned. Really? Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, if they stole, 
and stealing was in the navy. You can kill a man; it's all right, but stealing mm -hmm. tobacco right, is a, a crime. Mm -hmm. Yes, there were cases where they, they were flogged for. I can't remember what the case, why. Oh, breaking bounds, running, running away. You weren't allowed to. Once you're in, you're in. Yeah. In a way, and the, the cop, this chap, you want to remember, and he was kinned in the thing like a tower at the bottom of the. He, he, it's still there at the bottom of the what was a square. And uh, they've got the St. George Monument, uh, memorial on that particular tower. But there's a room in there they used to bring them in and whack them. Uh, but you had to be bad to get that. Uh, uh. So, what, how much shore leave did you get whilst you were at St. George? If you can call it shore leave, I guess you would, would you? You're allowed shore three days, three afternoons, a fortnight from one o'clock to six, yeah, and you were allowed, say, you went uh, Sunday, Wednesday and Saturdays, but alternately, so that you, you didn't have s Sunday, Wednesday and Saturday. Mm. You went Sunday and Saturday, Wednesday and, and so on. I see, yeah. yeah. Which was uh, good enough, they made the boys, uh, they had to have their three days a week, but not mm. all in the same spot. Yeah. Did you see much of the island, or would, no. did you just not have enough time? We went to Ramsey once, in a coach. They t it took us to um, just to Ramsey town to walk around, and people had a word with us there, just because they, were, they didn't see much of us. Mm. A couple of fishermen would be telling us how rough it was at sea. I can remember these fellas. Yes, mm. but, but I never saw anything of the rest of the island. We walked. Round often when we're at House Drake, up round um, opposite to the, the Glen, you know, the, what's it, the Glen? The Grower Glen. Oh. We faced Grower Glen and we'd go down onto the beach, a very steep pathway down there, and sometimes swimming, we were allowed to swim there, and then we'd go up on the other side and go way up past where. Um, uh, Bell Rhyme and then walk along the road back to the, the camp. It's a, it's a good, that was our hike, you know. Yeah. yeah. They made sure that we didn't uh, lie. And, yeah, our afternoon off, I mean, if we weren't allowed to show, we had the afternoon off. But they wouldn't let us just lie in our bunks and say, mm. yep, we'll go for a hike, <laughs> which is good. Yeah. Good for us. And when, when you finished and that finished your training at HMS St George. You went straight to sea, I think. Didn't you yeah, went straight to the to, to Liverpool to join the, uh, the Indomitable. We we didn't know uh, where the boys were going. I mean, we, there was an officer in charge of us. We t uh, in our case it was the petty officer who was in charge was going to the Indomitable, so we, that was fine. There was six of us. In this particular bunch, we went to the Indomitable. There's a few more going elsewhere. They went to all ships. There was no, uh, we, you had no choice. I mean, your name came up on the list and off you went. And of course, the Indomitable hadn't been to sea, but she had come from Barrow, where she was built, down to Liverpool to uh, get a fuel up and everything else. And that's where we joined her. So, and we had a week in Liverpool, and then up to Greenock, past the Isle of Man on, on the way. Mm -hmm. And I had my 18th birthday when we got to Greenock. And I didn't get a chance to go home. It was only <laughs> a few miles. A swim. <laughs> yeah, a swim, yeah, if, if you were allowed to, you know. Yeah. No, I wasn't allowed. Uh, what, what was your first impression of Indomitable when you saw her alongside? Well, the first thing we saw was the bow, yeah. because it, she was in the dock facing Liverpool, and when we came off the, 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 the truck that it took, oh no, we walked on from the, the church hall where we had slept the night before, and we come off this massive thing, the, the, the bows of the, an aircraft carrier, 
about hundred yards across. <laughs> Uh, and there's no uh, an ordinary ship. You, you, you have the, the prow, and you can see some of the forecastle before you come to any bridge work. But on the Indomito, all we had was this great big bow going up, and there's no forecastle at all. It's all built right up to the edge of the uh, the flight deck. And of course, it was a very wide flight, and you had no idea what you looked like at all. And I say, oh, you know. It's, <laughs> It's like going into a, a building, great building. But uh, they didn't let us uh, think about it too long. They had us in, had to go on the uh, uh, midships, went along the dockyard to get in. And the, the press, I mean, as soon as they allowed us, we were only off the deck, so we were amazed at the actual area that was. I mean, I had never. Uh, I've been on steamers on the Clyde, and there's no way uh, deck space at all. You know, a bit for where the passengers come together to, to get off, go ashore. But on her, it's just such massive area. Well, we played football on her, we hockey actually uh, regularly. And I suppose if they could have put nets up, we'd have been playing football as well. But Hockey was the, the game. But that was later, not when we joined at first. Mm -hmm. we, we spent a long time finding a way around through the shop. There's two things they told us when you go, is remember where your mess is. If you don't, uh, you'll never eat. So we we'll <laughs> remembered where that was. And don't walk in any part of the ship which has got green linoleum. Because all the, the decks of the, the living decks, basically, is brown linoleum. But green linoleum is officer country. If you, if you were caught walking in there, you, if you didn't have a note for the commander or somebody, you, you were fucked off. You know, <laughs> anyway, so. No, we learned very quickly not to walk on green linoleum. So you, you went up to Green at then for final commissioning, was it, before going I, to sea? I, I, I don't know why we went to go. I mean, we were oiled up. I, I thought we were oiled up in Liverpool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we probably topped up, in, you know. But that was it. We joined the convoy a few days after we, we got up there. Convoy was going to, as far as I remember, it was going to Canada in that direction. But we, we split from it because we were going to the West Indies. We were actually going to Bermuda first and ourselves. And we didn't even have a destroyer with us. We had no small escort with us. Never, never happened again. No? I suppose she was quite a fast vessel, though, was she? Oh, she was fast. Of things, so. Nobody was faster than a torpedo. I mean, well, so, yeah. they had you. Yeah, no, that surprised me. That like, we had our own aircraft uh, going round, searching all the time, making mm -hmm. sure there were, there were no submarines around. But that it didn't always work either. In any case, yeah. From there we went to, uh, I said Bermuda, and then on to Kings Jamaica. Except we ran aground. That was terrible. Terrible for the captain. He lost his job over that. Yes, it's the, the ultimate sin in the Navy, isn't oh, it, to run right. a ship ashore? It's, uh, well, the, the thing about it is the captain is responsible. Well, he, it wasn't his fault, it was mm -hmm. the navigator's fault. Mm -hmm. The old captain got the kick. And, well, the navigator got the kick as well, but that, that didn't happen for. I mean, we'd travelled halfway around the world before they they found a place to drop the captain and pick up another one. Mm. So you went to Norfolk, Virginia for repairs, I think. Oh didn't yes, you? yeah. When, uh, after we run aground, they, they, we couldn't do anything because uh, we were supposed to be flying off aircraft. But we couldn't get the speed up, so they took us to Norfolk, Virginia which was our first trip to America. 
Excellent. You, you took to that very well, did you, Amalika? You enjoyed it? Oh, we enjoyed that, yeah. yeah. Uh, the only thing I remember about the first time round was they, they weren't very friendly, the Americans. No? No, there were a lot of uh, anti-Brits there. I don't know why. Now, because they, this, was this just before Pearl Harbor? Or oh, just that was before Pearl Harbor. Right, yeah. And the second time we went, we went to Norfolk, we were a different type of person. Yeah. I mean, by that time they were in the war proper. And we couldn't go wrong the second time. We mm. couldn't believe it, actually, though it had been there the first time. And you, when did you cross the line for the first time? Just before Christmas 1941, we uh, left, to we refueled at Trinidad, uh, went down towards Cape Town, crossed the line, met old Father Thames or whatever else, and we got... He had, he had no chance of it. They were going around looking at people and saying, ah, you're a, a, a green... A greeny yogo, and they whipped us down and we got shaved, soaked and shaved, and then dumped with the water. But then you, you were supposed to get a, a certificate to say you had crossed the line. I never got one. Can't say we crossed it many times after that, I know, but the first time was the time you got your certificate. Yeah, and so we had to. A couple of days later, or a day later, it was Christmas Day. That was the first Christmas at sea in 1941. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I crossed the line one day, had Christmas the next. Mm. <laughs> so, yeah. And what did you do for Christmas on board? Because were you old enough to have your rum no, rationed? No, I, did. I was only 18 and I didn't get my rum until I was 20. And uh, you, rum was like gold. Uh, you could steal a man's wife, it wouldn't have bothered him, but to take his rum, you were in trouble. But one old chap in our mess, Scotsman he was as well, gave me a little sip at uh, Christmas. He said that this was, because Christmas is nothing to the Scotsman really, it's New Year. Mm -hmm. And he says, this is to let you know what it's like but don't take a sip, just a little sip you get, the end of all that, you'll get a clubber, you know. <laughs> so, but I never, I never really got the taste of it. When I eventually got my rum ration, you get rum with water. And when I became a petty officer, I got it neat. But it, as I say, I wasn't really into rum. I could use it like, a, well, like currency, I mean, if you wanted something, say, I'll give you a sip of my tot, you know, and if you really wanted something, I'll give you my tot, and you're going to go and kill your enemy for you <laughs> for that, you know. <laughs> you know. Which is fine, because I didn't particularly care for it. And after Christmas, you were heading towards aid, I think, were you at this time? Yeah, for... well, originally, we were, when we left Trinidad, the, um, the the route for the Indom, the, yeah, the Indom, was to go to Singapore to act as aircraft support for the Prince of Wales and the uh, <coughs> the battleship, I forget its name, it was with her. And we, we hadn't got down to Christmas when we got the word that they'd both been bombed and sunk by the Japanese. And that by this time, uh, Singapore was under pressure <coughs> and they realised they had to give them more aircraft and that they had the, the hurricane fighters were sent from Britain to um, Port Sudan by bits and pieces, I mean, they, were, they didn't fly there and we went to Port Sudan to pick them up, we had to drop all our own stuff off at um, Aden so that our hangars were clear, and when we went to uh, up to the, the Red Sea to Port Sudan, we took on 40, I think it was 49, the figure sticks in my mind, 49 uh, hurricanes. They were in the hangar and on the upper deck, and straight down to Singapore, 
Well, when we, when we got down to Singapore, <coughs> the uh, Japanese were in full strength bombing Singapore, so they said, no good putting the aircraft into Singapore, they'd be bombed on the ground. So we put to uh, Java, I can't think of the name of the Jakarta, something like <coughs> Jakarta. Oh, Surabaya, is that what you're thinking of? <laughs> Surabaya. It, it could be, I can't remember the name of the, 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 the town on Java. Mm. And we flew them to there, and uh, apparently, uh, right after the war, they, they weren't much use. They, 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 they were bombed actually in, in their place in Java, they were broken. They, didn't, they were no help to Singapore. Mm. So anyway, we went straight back to... Um, the one thing I, I remember was we refueled in Christmas Island. And Christmas Island is just off Java. Is, or was at that time, uh, not rule, but it was organised by Australia, came under the Australian government. And we, we, it's where the German battleship in the First World War, a warship anyway, that was in the uh, Indian Ocean, knocking off a lot of uh, British ships. She was sunk in there. I forget the name of that ship. Do you know, nothing stuck in my mind. But it's an American, a German. Oh, was it the Emden? No, that's not the name. No, no. but it, 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 it named something like you might be right to it. Anyway, that's that. The thing is stuck on my mind about Christmas, about Christmas Island. Anyway, we went straight back to to uh, to the Red Sea, got another load of aircraft. This time, we dropped them off at uh, Ceylon, and we were very fortunate because the Japanese were going to uh, bomb, possibly leave their uh, troops onto. Colombo onto uh, Ceylon, but they met these fighters that we had brought in and decided against them, thought it was too well defended. Which I felt better about that when I read about that in due course. It, it, was, it was worthwhile. We went through, we went round to uh, the Trincomalee, was the, the name of the small. Port and they, they still call it uh, Ceylon. I forget what name it is now. But that's we were fortunate there too because we, we we were there for about a week or two, and the excellent place we were swanning about and swimming in the bay and mm. lovely. And I met some friends of mine on the old uh, Hermes, an old pre-war aircraft carrier. And uh, she was bombed after we left there. And uh, the boys from St. George, there was four of them on, on, on the Hermes, and two of them were killed when the, when the uh, Japanese bombed them. So uh, they, they went out of St. George for all, what? They went out a year out of no. St. George, only months. Mm -hmm. And they got killed. Where was the telegraphist's office then, or quote, uh, your...? Oh, uh, well, we had several wireless offices. The main wireless office was on, uh, on the main deck. And uh, actually it was just below the, the officer's uh, wardroom. The, 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 the wardroom was there, the retiring room. This was the wireless office. And when we got bombed, it was there. The, the, everybody up there was killed, and their, their floor, their deck, mm. it, was, it was our deck head. Of course, it, it was uh, on fire coming through there. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll come on to that in, in, in due course. But uh, yeah, mm. did you get a chance to go on on deck much to watch the aircraft take oh, yes. off and land? When we were, were off watch, duty, yeah. yeah. I watched them all the time. Yeah. We, we became experts. We could see an aircraft. He's never going to make it. He's, he's too low or he's too high. You know. So I, that was in later days, actually, when I was on the, 
We were training them to land and take off. Mm -hmm. oh, that's where we started off, we were watching them. Right. And you were involved with the operation uh, for Mad on Madagascar, weren't you? The, uh, the invasion oh, of Madagascar. Oh, yes, I, I, it was called Ironside, Operation Ironside. They, they were, the, the British thought that the Japanese might want to use that as a, as a submarine base, but the, uh, the, the, Fr the French government were tied up with the German government, who were tied up with the Japanese government, and it was this cohesion of uh, the enemy that made them think that Japanese would want it as a submarine base. Well, in actual fact, the Japanese, they were wanting somewhere much further north because they were, the, the, Briti the British ships were running up the Red Sea coming from India much further north than, the, than the Madagascar, which wouldn't have been much use as a submarine base. So they mm -hmm. never took it as a submarine base. Right. But you were nearly torpedoed, I think, weren't you? Oh, you were I got a photograph. In, in, in the, we were going into the harbour, or oh, nearly, certainly near the harbour, when the, 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 the captain shouted, so I believe it was the captain who spotted it. And the, 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 the photographer, just like these gentlemen here, was, was always on the spot with his camera, mainly for the aircraft landing and taking off. He had to, when they were landing, he photographed them. So that if they had done anything wrong, they would oh, you should have been there. And when they were taken off, same thing. Well, that was his job. And he happened to be on the upper deck when this, this uh, torpedo was went past, so they flogged everyone on board the ship, got a couple, and made his fortune. <laughs> <laughs> and from, from after the Madagascar operation, you headed back to Britain, did you? After no, no, we were, um, were up in. Um, based at uh, Mombasa and we were, uh, aircraft were, we were looking for Japanese submarines. We were out cruising around there and uh, at some time during that it was decided about this convoy that they were going to send to Malta and uh, we were here about for it then so we made we made for the North Sea for the, uh, the Atlantic River. That would be, uh, well, around about June, July. That was the occasion where a wireless operator, like me, conscientious, in the middle of the night, we were going up towards Free, we'd, we'd left Freetown, and we are going up round the bulge of Africa to get up to the, uh, meet the fleet, and uh, we had two destroyers and a cruiser with us in company. And in the middle of the night, no lights were used, everything was dark, no, nobody could see it on that. And, but the radar picked up a ship coming, it was going to come near us. And the captain apparently didn't want anybody to know that we were in the vicinity. And he gave the order to alter course by so many degrees to, to port, of course. And uh, I was the operator in the uh, remote control room. The, the navigator gave me this message to tell the, the ships, all ships, to alter the course to so many degrees. So I did it. Well, I, I make the signal, and all the ships come back, I always do this. I make the signal, and they come back one by one received, 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 that was the three ships, fine. Now, before they can do it, they've got to get the executive signal, so the, the, the navigator says, executive, so I pressed the key, and that went all around the the, the, uh, the ships. Just so you keep the key pressed, it mm -hmm. makes a, a straight noise, and take the key off and then each ship comes back and says, received, received, received. Fine, except 
about ten minutes later, the commander came dashing down there. Have you sent a bloody message? I said, yes, sir. Said, in my log book. Three of the ships had uh, turned with the, us, but one of them had carried straight around there, hadn't moved, altered course. Uh, and they, they had me almost in cells. I said, I was telling the chief at the time, I said, well, I've got it in my log book. They, they, they all, they'll all have it in their log books, which they did. I mean, they, in due course, they had in the court of inquiry in uh, Gibraltar. This was after the Malta convoy too. And uh, I was standing out in the hall waiting to be called in. And then they, they, somebody came up and said, you can go home, you, you, you're not wanted. Because I always think everybody's book was a long mm. book. And it's obvious that they had all answered, that they had received the message. So I was clear that they got the message. <laughs> Mm. But it was just one of the things that could happen to you. So then you went on to assemble or join the, the convoy. Yeah, we joined the convoy for Malta. For, yeah. Uh, yeah. for Malta. Yeah. There um, were, how many carriers were there? There was you well, in Indomitable and Eagle, I think, wasn't there? Well, we, we were the, the, the Indomitable and the uh, sister ship, the, the Victorious. She was there, and the uh, the Argus, the Eagle, and his terrible names. Because Illustrious was out of action by then, wasn't oh, she? Oh, yeah, she, she, yeah, she was uh, up in America uh, yeah. repaired. Yeah. To, uh, how, how much of the news did you pick up on the ship? You know, but being in the the wireless office, presumably you would be but, into, you know receiving the BBC. Yeah, well, it, 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 all the instructions that were given to the ship uh, are kept between the officers. The, mm. the captain and his his the immediate uh, senior officers get all the. I mean, we got the messages by code, a cipher. And we had the cipher officer was in our way, and he would decode them and give the message to the captain. Now he knew what the message was. The captain would tell the ones who needed to know. But we, we didn't know from the minute we were gone up the Atlantic to, to join the uh, convoy. We didn't know anything about the, the convoy. Mm. And when we got to, we, mixing with the fleet, then it, then we knew because we had certain signals that we had to keep in contact with various places. Oh God, we, we know where we're going now. But, but often we knew because uh, what was going on. But of course we weren't allowed to tell anybody. But we used to get crack on if we were going to. If it was. We're going to uh, uh, America, for example. We'd say we're going to America. Good old, you know. Well, they eventually be made known anyway. So things like that, we could keep quiet. You know, tell them quietly where we're going. Mm. But you weren't allowed to. That's the Conway itself is. I, I didn't. I mean, I thought <laughs> when we were bombed. We were out the night the ship was no use any longer. We turned and went back to, to, to Gibraltar. I thought, good job we got bombed, it's saved because all the rest, I thought, carried on to Malta. Mm -hmm. They hadn't got far to go, you know, a couple of hundred, three hundred miles, I think it was. But when I found out later years that we were intended to, to turn anyway, we were at the point. <laughs> Where the main fleet, I mean, were battleships, the Rodney and the Nelson, Great Big, they were all turned back as well. That was all meant to be that. They, they only had to go so far in case the Italians sent a fleet out, and they hadn't done so, they all turned out back. And I thought, all these p p merchant ships, they, they, well, there were 14 of them to begin with. We left them there and they turned around and what five of them got in in the end, it sunk a lot, and it just bombed them. But of course, the, our warships were getting hammered as well. 
<laughs> Manchester was sunk. The uh, uh, to the Kenya, Mauritius, they were torpedoed, but they made back to Gibraltar. Uh, real hammer. Yeah. Did you see any of them being bombed? Were you on deck when you know? No, I, uh, unfortunately, I was always yeah. in the in the wilds. I saw them once it was done. I mean, I, 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 I was off duty. I got yeah. and have a look. So, but you couldn't do anything about it. The, the eagle one, when she was torpedoed, I mean, she. By the time I got on the upper deck, she, she had turned over and sunk. So no, oh, that was a few minutes. You know, they were lucky there's any survivors at all. Mm. Yeah. The, the, in your wireless office, then the the noise must have been terrific, though, from the ACAT guns on on, on board. And well, well generally, you know, we were quite soundproof. Was it? Yeah, ah, yeah. Right, yeah. The, the, not so in the, the remote control or on the upper deck, but that was different. You could hear everything going on there. Mm. But the, the central office where I was, it, it was quite quiet there. You, you could hear the books sort of boom, you know what was going on, but it, it, it wasn't It wasn't interrupting our hearing on the thing. It, it did when the bomb went up alongside us and blew the roof in. Mm. Of course, it blew the heavy set out anyway, so we had to abandon ship, well, abandon the, uh, the room. Mm. And did you have any warning? Were there any near misses before the, the bomb hit the ship? Well, uh, then again, you see, I, I, up until that particular time, I was in this room and we knew the, the, the bombs were gone, the Gideon bombs, but not near misses or anything. Mm. The first thing I had was, we knew about it, was when it, it we all went up like this, we said, what was that? It was a bomb that hit the, the after end of the ship and blew the flight, the uh, lift right out and there. It was a real mess it was. Well, the ship had gone up like that, of course, but, but almost simultaneously, we're just getting used to that, not simultaneously, we're getting used to that when one went off on the forehead end of the flight deck. That's the one that killed all the, a lot of men, that one. But then at the same time as that went off, this one went off alongside us, blew the thing. So uh, we weren't really, oh, funny enough, wasn't scared. No. I just didn't know what was going on. You get, you mm. fill your, your head with a bang. And, you know, particularly the, the one that, we were filled with smoke, you know, with the thing it was on fire. And I was more worried about getting burnt than, than anything, you know. But it, it, we got out of it fairly, fairly, fairly easily, actually. Yeah, so you went back to Gibraltar then, what for emergency repairs and... Uh, you just you go straight up to... Uh, to England then. Yeah, because the, the, the flight deck was out of action, wasn't it? Oh, the yes. Yeah, yeah, well, the, the, yeah. the, the forward lift and the after lift had both been blown mm. out. So, although we, we had a, an armoured plated uh, flight deck, that saved us. Mm. Yeah. Were any of the aircraft airborne at this time? Did they, did they have to ditch? Yeah, or land on? They, they actually, they, they landed on the Victoria, so that was the, uh, yeah. the, the, the big aircraft carrier, a lot big wheelers. But they, as soon as they landed on the Victoria, they were dumped because she hadn't any room for them, you see. Ah, yeah. yeah. So, so we lost a lot of aircraft, we lost a few pilots. Uh, I'm glad I wasn't in the fleet um, at the time. Uh, yeah. Yes, life was cheap, wasn't it? Yeah. For those guys, sadly. Yeah. So the, the ship went back to Liverpool, I think, then, did she? For... The ship went to Liverpool, yeah. yeah. We were sent, to, uh, we were given two weeks leave each. And uh, when I came back from leave, I was sent down to the signal school in uh -huh. Portsmouth. And it was only, it was only there. Two, two weeks or something, 
And I got a, a, a draft that sent me away abroad. So I've just come back from abroad. <laughs> Tough, they said. And they, but as it happened, I'd been sent to America as well to pick up a new ship. Yeah. And I, that was a right mess up. Because they, they didn't give me a, a, a name and they just gave you a number, ACV 24, I was going to. I didn't realise that it was aircraft carrier number 24. Number 24? The Americans built something like 40 of them for us, you know. They were auxiliary aircraft carriers. Yeah. And this was HMS Ravager, wasn't it? That was the Ravager, yeah. yeah. Now, she was a converted merchant ship, wasn't she? She well, wasn't built as a... No, she was yeah. built as a, a merchant ship, but she'd never been, uh, um, never been a merchant right. ship. Right, yeah. She, her hull was built as a merchant ship, and then they built a hangar on top of that and a flight deck on top of it. And the accommodation was for merchant seamen, not for Royal Navy men at all. We didn't have the, uh, the usual sort of uh, facilities. At least not where I was. <laughs> our our uh, deck was all along the side of the ship, so we had a little narrow passage, and we had our bunks on that. <laughs> we got we got all the sleep we needed. I suppose we couldn't grumble. Mm. Were you involved? She was on convoy duty at first, wasn't she? But then we now on training duties. Yeah, we did, we, we did about four, about four, four convoys. Yeah. yeah. We were quite happy to do the... Well, I didn't realise that we were doing this training, aircraft landing and taking off. I thought it was just a new flight that we got on board and oh, we were training them to take off. And then it dawned on us, well, we got the message that we would be continue to do the deck landing training. They took us off a couple of times to do a, 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 a convoy to Gibraltar and a convoy to America. But, but generally speaking, that's how we passed our time. It's interesting. Yeah, but that was, it was mainly in the Irish Sea, was it? The, the actual yeah. deck landing yeah. training. It was yeah. at the, the foot of the Clyde, look where it widened into the Irish Sea mm. and gave us plenty of room to fly around. And what, what happened after VE Day then, or VJ Day? What, did you stay in the Navy? Well, after VJ Day, we, the, uh, we, we did about three or four months still training people to land, take, take on and land off. To, uh, land on and take off. We did it on the east coast and came up round the north back to the to the Clyde. I, I, we did a trip down, we went down round uh, uh, along the English Channel up to London. I don't know why we went to, to, to London then. From London we did the east coast and did carried on training and up round the, the very north back to the Clyde, and then they said, you can go home, the ship's gone to America, to be broken up. She wasn't broken up, she was transferred back into a, into a merchant ship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My next salute was onto the Belfast. I spent my time with her. The, the, the captain of the Belfast, uh, at the time was an admiral, a rear admiral, Dennis Boyd. He came over here, he, he, when he retired from the Navy, he became a, a, a keen gardener. And he, he came over, it must have been an invitation of the Manx gardening lot because I remember him going into the villa to, to see all the gardens there at the time. But I, when I was on the Belfast, I thought, he used to be on the Indomus, or he was the Admiral on the Indomus when I was on. I'll, I'll have a word, so I came out, I came out the radio room in the, it was in the upper deck of the Belfast, standing there, and he came out from his cabin, and he stood there, you know, same distance 
he didn't say, well, if he'd said good morning, I would have, uh, you know, I'd, I would have spoken to him. Maybe. I was too frightened. He was <laughs> an admiral then. I was going to tell him I'd sailed with him before on the, the Dom when he was a, a, a rear admiral. He was a full admiral by this time. So I didn't speak to him. I just let him wait. I was his, his personal radio operator as well. He got, he got his, his messages sent every day from Hong Kong, most of our headquarters. And he wanted to know every day what was going on. Could I line them up with voice radio with Hong Kong, which he did do. But when he was speaking to me then, he was up in his uh, cabin and I was down in the, the radio room mm. just fixing this thing. I'd say, you're on the air, sir, you're on. I think he could have been Charlie Chan talking to me while he knew. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So eventually you left the Navy. You weren't very happy to go away. Well, no, I was. Uh, I changed. I joined the Fleet Air Arm again. Funnily enough, uh, a new branch that they had brought out for uh, ra aircraft radio engineer. Of course, the word engineer is only used for officers in the Navy. No matter who, if you are an engineer, you become an artificer if you're not an officer. But uh, this was what I was going to be in. I'd done a year's training on it. And then to, we went down to hospital in Portsmouth, six weeks down there. Then nobody ever looked at me to see what was wrong. They said, ah, you, know, you can't go to sea, you might as well be out. I was peeved. That was what, was it 1947 when you left? Uh, 1947, yes. Yeah, my yeah. last day of service was December 48. Mm -hmm. And then you, you came to live on the island at that time, was it? Yes, well, I, I, at Christmas time, I thought, I might, somebody says, you want to get yourself a job. Post office has got them Christmas postman on. Oh, yeah. So I went and got a job as a postman for Christmas for a week. I had another job where I had already arranged with a um, chap at the airport for uh, the thing I'd just been trained on. Mm -hmm. it's all, you, know, you have to go to London to get, uh, uh, to get exams, you know. So I went to London and uh, took the written exam. They said, yes, you're OK. I went back to him and I said, right, I'm ready. And he said, oh, sorry. The job's been taken, somebody else. So I, I went up to, up to Albert, got the job at the Christmas postman, and he, he said to me, I've got vacancies for postman, he said, if you like the job. I said, well, I, I won't be long. I said, I'm looking for jobs elsewhere. So he said, all right. So I went down to London twice. I went down to the... Uh, Clerical office. A job, I'd tried to go uh, abroad, I was mad, to, to, to the foreign office, and I got accepted. And <laughs> I remember the head postmaster by this time came and says, When are you going this, to the foreign office? I said, Well, I'll wait until I'm asked. He said, well, they, they keep ringing up and saying, are you ready, available to go? I said, I said well, no, not yet, because uh, my wife's expecting and I'd, the last one I was born when I was in Singapore, I want to be here for the next one. So I, that was my excuse. And in the end, I turned it down. I've got that stupid, and I oh, no, wanted to go abroad again. Hmm. It's it just a thought, I should have a Decent job, you know, as a wireless operator and nothing else. Uh, yeah, but you, you ended up with the post office in Douglas, didn't you? With the, with, with well, the well, postmaster in Douglas. Huh? No, oh no, I, I, I stayed with Albert Cockish for a couple, two years as a mm. postman, and then I went as a clerk to, to Manchester. And uh, from Manchester, I went to Ramsey Post Office as a clerk 
and then back to Douglas as a clerk. And then later on in the years when the Mike's government took over the post office, the, the chap, the one at Ramsey, uh, they went back to England. He didn't want to become a Manxman. And the Manx, the British post office wouldn't put anybody from there into the, the Manx post office. So they, they said you'd have to fill it from locally. Mm. And that's when I was sent to Ramsey. I spent 13 years down there. So all right. Could have been worse. Could have been Castletown. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, did you enjoy your time in the post office? Though? Oh, you, yes. I guess you worked there till you retired, did you? Uh, uh, six, 60 when I retired. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. On pension. Mm -hmm. Right. So you'll have a chance to see a little bit more of the Island Man than when he first came in 1940, then. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Well, the, the, the Navy gave me a pension, you know, because they took me out. Oh, yeah. 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 So I got a pension for that. It sounds all right. I talk, every time I talk about that, I said, I was 20, 26. And they, they pensioned me out, out of the Navy. 23. Yeah, I was 20, 25. And if. I've been drawing a pension for 70 years. <laughs> <laughs> so right. Very good. Well, that's my ambition. Yeah. <laughs>